Good evening, everyone, and it's, it's great to see such a, a large crowd here on a very wet evening. Welcome to the second in the series of the University of Melbourne's Anzac Centenary Lectures. My name is Kate Darian smith and I'm the Professor of Australian Studies and History and Chair of the History Program here at the University in the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on, on which this event is taking place, the land of the Wurundjeri people, and pay respect to their elders and families past and present. I also extend a special welcome to any veterans and current servicemen and women who are here with us this evening. Tonight is the second of the University's Anzac Centenary Lectures. This series brings together some of Melbourne's most important scholars and thinkers to consider how the changes ushered in during the First World War still resonate today. These discussions were conceived by Dr. James Waghorn from the University of the University, from the, sorry, from the History of the University Unit, and James is here tonight, and they've been uh, held in a way echoing a series of public lectures that were organised by the University of Melbourne during 1915. Lectures that aimed to assist Melburnians make sense of the Great War. Two weeks ago at the Shrine of Remembrance, the first of this current lecture series discussed the recent archaeological survey of the Gallipoli battlefields. The survey revealed, among many other things, the different diet of the respective combatants. The Turks had access to fresh food, while the Anzacs endured bully beef and tinned rations and faced acute uh, water shortages. The huge three-volume official history of the Australian medical services in the First World War described the Gallipoli campaign as, quote, a disease debacle with many of those sick with diarrhoea and dysentery greatly outnumbering the dead. In 1915, as part of the University of Melbourne's public lectures, William Osborne, the Professor of Physiology, spoke on the challenges of battlefield nutrition. Osborne considered the heat and energy and the fibre and protein of various foodstuffs. Under his scheme, a fighting ration of bread and jam was considered quite healthy. Osborne's lecture predated modern theories about the vitamin content of food and reminds us, I think, of just how much medical knowledge has been learned since, and much of that uh, during the First World War. In the industrialised warfare of that, that conflict, the provision of health care was instrumental for military success. There were two mil uh, medical issues, those of injury and those related to illness and disease. New fighting strategies of artillery shelling, tunnelling and mining, machine guns and the advent of chemical attacks created new conditions that had to be dealt with uh, medically, such as disfiguring wounds, trench foot, trench mouth and so on. Uh, and did so on a scale that was unprecedented, and I think before the First World War, uh, like so many uh, things that happened in the First World War, completely unimaginable. There was also the spread of disease, including the worldwide pandemic of influenza in 1918 to 19, which had more fatalities than the Black Death. The war was indeed one where the sick fought the infirm. In response, scientific innovation, innovations that had lasting effects on the practice of medicine were developed and health was a primary concern of the combatants. Australian doctors, dentists, surgeons and other health professionals answered the call and enlisted en masse. The University of Melbourne shortened its medical degrees to provide the training necessary for frontline service. A number of women medical doctors 
uh, who were excluded from the military services made their own way to Europe to serve in field hospitals. The contribution of thousands of Australian nurses serving in the war, both in Australian and in British uh, hospitals, was highly significant. Many of those in the medical field who served during the First World War did not return, and their loss was acutely felt. During the First World War and in trying circumstances, new medical treatments emerged, and I'll just mention a few. The Welsh surgeon Hugh Owen Thomas pioneered the use of traction splints to set bones broken by shrapnel, um, which is credited as reducing the death rate from as high as 80% to less than 10%. Blood transfusions, a technique uh, developed in the years leading up to the war, were used on a large scale for the first time. The administration of saline fluid into patients with wound shock, a condition in which men with relatively minor injuries presented with ashen grey complexions and failed to thrive, was also pioneered. These are celebrated cases, but the true story of the medical war was much broader. And tonight we were going to examine a number of these medical advances and recall how this reflected on medicine then and what enduring uh, resonances these elements had for the continuing practice of, of medicine, dentistry uh, and so on today. And I also um, commend to you the informative exhibition entitled uh, Compassion and Courage, Doctors and Dentists at War that is now showing at the university's medical museum. I just uh, should advise our audience that we are recording this event and the recording will be made available on the university's website after tonight. And it's now my very great pleasure to introduce our esteemed panel who will all uh, present their own brief reflections on the medical war before we open up this session to a wider conversation. Professor Douglas Hilton uh, is the director of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute and research professor of medical biology and head of the Department of Medical Biology as well at the University of Melbourne. His research interest is molecular regulation of blood cell formation and function. Professor Sharon Lewin is the director of the Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity and is an Australian National Health and Medical Research Council Practitioner Fellow. She is a past president of the Australasian Society for HIV Medicine and currently serves on the government's Ministerial Advisory Committee on Bloodborne Viruses and sex Sexually Transmitted Infections and on the International AIDS Society International Working Group. In 2014, Professor Lewin was honoured as the Melbourneian of the Year. Dr Warren Crosley is Deputy Head of Oral Surgery at the Royal Dental Hospital. Warren trained as an oral and max maxillofacial surgeon in South Africa where he gained experience in trauma management, including gunshot injuries. He moved to Melbourne in 2008 and currently lectures at the University of Melbourne and conducts private practice in Hawthorne. The Doherty Institute is named after uh, Laureate Professor Peter Doherty, who shared the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1996 for the discovery of how the immune system recognises virus-infected cells. He was Australian of the Year in 1997 and has since been commuting between St Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis in the United States and the Department of Micro Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Melbourne. His research is mainly in the area of defence against viruses and Peter regularly devotes time to delivering public lectures and media uh, commentary. So welcome uh, to the panel. We're going to hear from them in succession and I'd like to uh, invite Professor Hilton to take the podium first.
Thank you so much. Um, I'm not going to talk about the medical problems that were associated with the Great, Great War. I'm going to talk about uh, a topic that, as an institute, the Walsh and Liza Hall Institute, we've been reflecting on for the last few days, and that's a topic around the loss of potential. And this is a topic that has been beautifully covered by the author Ross McMullen in his poignant and beautiful book, Farewell, Dear People. And anybody who has not yet read Ross's book and has any interest in the Great War or war history, I would commend the book to you um, in, the highest, in the highest way. Ross's book contains 10 extended biographies of young men who exemplified the generation Australia lost in the Great War, including the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute's inaugural director-designate, Gordon Clunes Mackay Matheson. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about Matheson. He was a pretty special guy. Matheson was born in 1883 in country Victoria, and he grew up in Melbourne and was educated at Elstonwick Primary School and Caulfield Grammar. After that, as a member of Queen's College at this university, he studied medicine. Uh, and after graduating, he undertook medical research in London. And that, that's a, the sort of trajectory many researchers take today. Do their basic training and their PhD, for example, at this university and then travel overseas to get additional experience. Matheson was brilliant. He spent a few years in London working in a couple of different laboratories and published a string of papers that led him to be acclaimed as one of the top researchers of his generation. On the declaration of war towards the end of 1914, Matheson enlisted and was uh, part of the Second Field Ambulance, Australian Army Medical Corps. Matheson then returned to Melbourne, um, bound for Egypt aboard the HMAT wheelchair where he was attached to the 5th Battalion of the Australian Imperial Force and was deployed to Gallipoli on just before the Gallipoli landing. A few days after he arrived in Gallipoli on the 10th of May, while sitting in camp quite a long way from the front, he was wounded in the head from a stray bullet. He was evacuated to Alexandria and without ever regaining consciousness, died 100 years ago the day before yesterday on the 18th of May, 1915. The Institute had been established uh, in partnership by the University of Melbourne, the Walter and Eliza Hall Trust, and the Royal Melbourne Hospital on the 23rd of April, less than a month before Matheson was killed. And the letter offering him the inaugural directorship of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute was sent on the 23rd of April, but he died never knowing of the offer that he was to receive. Last Monday, a couple of days ago, we unveiled a statue by Michael Mazaros commemorating Matheson's death and mourning the loss of potential. It's actually on the forecourt of the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute, and anybody who doesn't know the Institute, we're almost directly opposite this building on the other side of Royal Parade, tucked between the Royal Melbourne Hospital and University High School. And anybody who's interested in um, sculpture or Matheson is most welcome to have a look at the sculpture on the forecourt. Matheson's story is pretty well known. I think what's less known is that our first and second directors, those who actually took up the post, Sidney Wentworth Patterson and Charles Haley Kellaway, were also medical doctors in the Great War. Patterson was born in Melbourne the year before Matheson, and Kellaway was born in Melbourne six years later. Like Matheson, Kellaway was educated at Caulfield Grammar. Patterson was educated at Scotch College. Like Matheson, both Patterson and Kellaway attended medical school at the University of Melbourne. Kellaway is a fellow of Trinity and Patterson a fellow of Ormond rather than at Queen's, like Matheson. Patterson and Kellaway both enlisted and both served during the Great War. Like Matheson, Kellaway was sent to Egypt where he served before being sent on to Flanders in 1917. Patterson served in France as a pathologist for a couple of years from 1917 to the end of the war. Unlike Matheson, Patterson and Kellaway survived. Like Matheson, Patterson had worked in London 
Patterson worked with the great physiologist E.H. Starling in 1913 and 14, just before the war, and actually fell in love and married Starling's favourite daughter. Patterson was appointed as the first director of Weehai in 1919. In the last year of the war, Kellaway also worked in London on, an, an, on anoxia, and he also worked with E.H. Starling, and although I'm not certain of it, I suspect they knew each other while working together in Starling's lab. Kellaway stayed with Starling in London until 1923 when he moved back to Melbourne to take over the directorship of WEHI, the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute from Patterson, who moved back to England to pursue more clinically grounded research and also for family reasons. And we, cel we celebrate our annual general meeting tomorrow in our centenary year as an institute and one of the remarkable things about that annual general meeting is that we're going to have their Patterson's daughter who lives in Tasmania. Patterson died in 1960 and was director of WEHI uh, over 90 years ago. It's remarkable that his daughter's able to attend. Those three men, their backgrounds, as I've outlined, were very much intertwined. Similar experiences in war, their destinies and the realisation of their potential and their contribution to humanity were ultimately determined by the trajectory of a stray bullet. What I'd like to reflect on, and I, what I'd like you to reflect on, is how many other scientists or doctors or academics or people in other walks of life, how many of them, are, how many of their destinies are determined by such random events? And I'd like to reflect just on one more scientist. One of my favourite autobiographies, and it, maybe it's my, my favourite because it's about one of my favourite scientists, is that of the dual Nobel Prize winner in physiology or medicine, Fred Sanger. And this autobiography was published in the Annual Reviews of Biochemistry in 1988. Sanger was born towards the end of the Great War in 1918. And in, in this review, in, in this autobiography, rather reflectively said, I was not academically brilliant. I never won scholarships and would probably not have been able to attend Cambridge if my parents had not been fairly rich. However, when it came to research, where experiments were of, apparent, were of paramount importance and fairly narrow specialisation was helpful, I managed to hold my own, even with the most academically outstanding. Sanger's family wealth allowed him to fund himself through his PhD and into his postdoctoral years and really got him a start in research. I wonder how many unknown Sangers were born into the slums of Manchester or London at the same time Sanger was born into relative wealth in Gloucestershire. How many unknown Sangers couldn't pay their way to university or bankroll the early years of their research life? How many unknown Sangers have given up because they had no good role models at high school or were unsuccessful in getting their APAs, their postgraduate awards that we have now as uh, support for PhD students? or gave up because they didn't get their first National Health and Medical Research Council grant, or because they lacked the support at home or from their employers after having children. We know that fate can be capricious at war, but it can be equally capricious in times of peace. So what I'd like to ask a lot of you who may have links to the university, have seen your roles in industry in the community is, let's be aware of the unnecessary obstacles and barriers we place in front of people as they try and fulfil their potential. Thank you. Well, welcome and uh, great to see a full audience on a miserable uh, Melbourne night. I'll start by saying that I'm no historian, I'm an infectious diseases physician and basic scientist, and have essentially spent my career and most of my daylight hours focusing on HIV and AIDS. So when I reflected on what unique perspective I could possibly bring to the conversation this evening, I thought of two aspects of the medical war that I think uh, were hugely important and perhaps less frequently highlighted in our ANZAC reflections 
and our, in our discussions of the great medical challenges of that time. And they are women and sex. So I've been fascinated by the role female doctors played in World War I. And I'll start by saying that my inspiration has come from reading most of the work and writings of uh, Heather Shroud, a postdoctoral fellow here at the University of Melbourne, who has extensively researched the role of women in the medical war. I think Heather um, is here, to here tonight. Not sure if I can see her in the audience. And I'd like to acknowledge her work up front. So a few interesting facts that many of you in the room might not know. By 1914, uh, there were only 130 women registered as medical practitioners in Australia, but none were allowed to enlist in the armed services from Australia, New Zealand and England. However, by 1918, more than 20 Australian women had actually worked as surgeons, medical officers, anaesthetists and pathologists across Europe and were directly involved in the war effort. So how did they get there? Well, firstly, just as a result of sheer need, the medical services of the Allied armies were simply overwhelmed by the challenge of wounded soldiers, but in addition, by the consequences of great movements of people, both the military and fleeing civilian populations. And this led to very significant outbreaks of infectious disease, diseases such as typhoid and typhus, for which we had no treatment back then, but now entirely treatable diseases. The second was the formation of voluntary medical units and hospitals in England and Europe that were actually outside the aegis of the, of the Royal Army Medical Corps, and women were allowed to work in these hospital networks and did some amazing things there. I was fascinated by another story, a story of the Sydney pathologist Elsie Daylell. A brilliant student, Elsie was the first Australian woman to be awarded a prestigious fellowship to study at the Lister Institute in London in 1914. After arriving within months, she was sent to Serbia in February of 1915 to manage a typhus epidemic. After Serbia, she moved to a field hospital in France and at 34, she was one of the oldest doctors in the team who treated many of the badly wounded soldiers from the battlefields. Quite incredible to fathom that people were doing that at that age. She then went on to complete some groundbreaking work around gas gangrene, a major infection that can complicate dirty wounds, now entirely treatable with uh, penicillin and surgery, but then a devastating, universally fatal complication of injury. And in 1919, she was appointed an officer of the Order of the British Empire and was decorated by the government of Serbia. She then worked briefly in Vienna as a researcher and in the early 1920s returned to Sydney and couldn't find a job. In fact, this was a very common experience for many of the great heroic medical women. They became overqualified. In contrast to their male colleagues, Elsie and many of her female colleagues, once back in Australia, were unable to set up private practice, couldn't get an appointment as a consultant at a public hospital, a critical role for um, any medical practitioner. And even worse would have been that she had very few colleagues to share her experiences with. In contrast to the returned service men, there were no similar networks for women. And I read of um, many who suffered greatly from isolation, depression, and the outrageously limited opportunities when they, have pr when they had proved to be so competent. Over tonight, I think we will hear some of the great heroes of the medical war, and clear clearly the very special medical women should not be forgotten. Now to the other forgotten story, sex. And sex in foreign places usually comes with a problem of sexually transmitted infections, something we rarely talk about, but was hugely important at that time. In the US Army during World War I, sexually transmitted infections were the second most common reason for disability and absence from duty, being responsible for nearly 7 million lost person days and the discharge of more than 10,000 men. Only the Spanish influenza epidemic of 1918 to 19 accounted for more loss of duty during that war. 
and amongst the Australian forces, it was estimated that at least 60,000 Australian soldiers were treated by army doctors for venereal infections between 1914 and 1919, something we don't talk about much. But what was really alarming to me when I read about this more was not just the scope of the problem, but how sexually transmitted infections were managed, and not just how they were medically managed, how they were managed in other social aspects which are so important. It was an offence to conceal a sexually transmitted inf infection. Its victims were guilty of misconduct. It actually still remains so. But what was vastly different at the time of World War I was the total disregard for confidentiality and the incredible stigma associated with a sexually transmitted infection, including being shunned by society and designated as a sinner by the church. Amazingly, following the diagnosis of a sexually transmitted infection, a soldier's pay was stopped for the duration of their treatment. And surely if that happened, how could that have been kept confidential? Families at, at home would have been very quickly aware of the diagnosis. Nowadays, there's such incredible attention towards confidentiality in this setting. It was amazing to read this. Added to that, there was only a brutal regimen of toxic cocktails administered by injection with no evidence of any benefit, and we now know there was no benefit. And of course, the discovery of penicillin means that now syphilis and gonorrhea, which were the commonest sexually transmitted infections at the time, can actually be cured, but that didn't arrive until the 1940s. Prevention from sexually transmitted infections was also probably never discussed and close to, impos and, and, and close to impossible, really, aside from abstinence, which we know never really works um, uh, on any large scale. At the time, prophylactic ointments of mercury and silver and vulcanised rubber condoms were all that was around and obviously not too popular. So William Osler, a huge figure in modern medicine, once said that in war, the microbe kills more than the bullet. And this couldn't have been truer than in World War I. Traditionally, we think of surgical infections being the big killer, and of course, they were incredibly important, but there were so many others. Um, influenza, which I'm sure you'll hear much more about from Peter, typhoid, typhus, the two organisms um, Elsie worked so hard on, tuberculosis, and of course, sexually transmitted infections. So in our conversations tonight, let's not forget two critically important, often forgotten stories of the medical war and celebrate the great advances we now enjoy for both medical women and the dramatic changes in the way we manage and prevent sexually transmitted infections. Thank you. Good evening. Um, coming from South Africa, uh, traumatic background and we treated, we still treat patients from um, northern areas, uh, Rwanda, Burundi, um, and uh, war is still carrying on. Uh, we're very lucky, I've got a family uh, living in Melbourne and it is great to live in Melbourne. Injuries in World War II uh, learnt a lot from what happened in World War I. The injuries in World War I were very different to anything previously uh, experienced. In the trenches, um, people were in a, a little narrow ditch. We've just heard um, the, it was wet, it was muddy, the um, conditions are not great, the food was not good. Uh, these are young people. We need to remember these were young guys who some of them didn't even have a family of their own yet. Uh, and normally they would be healthy, but because of the circumstances they were in, they weren't. Um, trenches were dug in farmland and we've got manure, we've got decaying, uh, decomposing material there. There are rats, there are all sorts of uh, things uh, much more likely to get gas gangrene. There's no antibiotics. Um, the other thing about uh, trench warfare is the vulnerability of, of the face, the head and neck. Um, guys were in trenches, it uh, pre prevents any damage to your body, but you just pop your head above there. And these guys were not in there just day and night for a short while. They were there for years. Um, if you, if you watch any of the um, YouTube videos, um, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty difficult to understand that it, it wasn't advancing. You'd need a tank or something else to, to, to advance the front. So they were just in there and um, 
in, in trying to survive. Um, the other thing that's different is, is the weapons. The weapons were the in, invention of the machine gun and um, large caliber weapons. Uh, shrapnel. Shrapnel was, was completely new, and the type of injury you get that from that is instead of just um, breaking bone, you'd have shattered bone, and you'd also have loss, complete loss of soft tissue. Um, where someone's involved in a motor vehicle accident, um, uh, things are disarrayed, and you, it's like putting back a, a puzzle. You take the pieces, you put them back, and we've got plating, we've got all sorts of things these days. Um, these guys had, um, they would survive and they would go back. So I'm, I'm thinking for every person who died in, uh, in World War I, at least two went back injured. And they were surviving this, but they weren't going back to normal life. They were going home, but they were not going back to normal life. Um, cleaning of wounds had changed, so uh, obviously much better. Debriding wounds, necrotic tissue removed, um, copious saline lavage, uh, development of sodium hypochlorite, uh, still called Milton's today, and Edinburgh University solution, USOL, was used up until the 90s, you could buy it in South Africa still, and um, of course no antibiotics. So surgeons of the time were, were very reliant on a, on a really good blood supply, and fortunately for us, our faces do have an excellent, excellent blood supply. Um, prior to World War I, there were, there were only porters, so for people to um, get transferred to a, a hospital, there, there, wasn't, uh, there was no recognition for kind of a first responder. And so this is something that really was developed well at the time, and they would put on tourniquets, they would uh, stop bleeding, and they would provide morphine, give, it, give some tea, and something probably not today, they'd give them a cigarette. Um, not really a great medical advancement, that. New Zealand-born Harold Gillies was only 32 at the time of the year. He was uh, at the time of the war. He was an ENT, and he recognised that there was a, a vast need for reconstructive surgery, um, and particularly to the face, and not just restoring function, but also aesthetics. Um, the whole psychological impact of a facial injury um, but up until this stage wasn't really recognized, and I think even still it wasn't recognized. Um, he set up, uh, along with the um, British Armed Medical Corps, he set up a plastic surgery unit, and they developed a specially designed hospital, the Queen's Hospital, at Sidcup in London, where 5,000 5, men were treated between 1917 and 1925. Um, the advantage of this, this kind of thing is that a large number of, um, of casualties were treated and records were, records were taken as case studies and we learn easily from that. And I look at my training relative to what, we have, what, we, what we're providing in Australia and when there's a sporadic case here or there, it's quite difficult to remember uh, exactly what you did last time. But when you're doing a number of these again and again and again, it's a lot easier to learn from those cases. Uh, Gillies was very keen to document uh, the surgery and the outcomes. They clearly didn't have video cameras or anything like that, um, but they had color pastel uh, sketches and artists took um, uh, photos as well, uh, just black and white photos of, uh, of before and after, and uh, they raised flaps from distant sites. What he was uh, really well renowned for was um, uh, the tube pedicle, uh, where, where tissue is missing, in order to put tissue at that site, you need a blood supply to be developed. And when you just take tissue from somewhere else and place it there, uh, particularly without antibiotics, uh, that, is going to, that is going to die. So what they did is they would they'd raise a pedicle from another site, a distant site, and f flap it around, uh, attach it to the, to the site where it needed to be placed, and then uh, roll it into a tube and suture down the tube so you would have a basically a, could look like a, the handle of a, of a beer mug going from your chest to your face, and then that would need to stay like that until the blood supply had developed and it got a blood supply at the site of um, where it had been inserted, and then you could re release it um, from the uh, host site. And um, uh, this, is, this was one of the major things that they did. They also developed uh, new instruments, and we still, every surgeon knows about a Gillies and a Macindose, and so not just the techniques, but the uh, the materials and the uh, equipment that we use. And just, for, just out of interest, after the Battle of the Somme in July 1916, more than 2,000 guys were um, 
uh, injured and needed surgery in one, in one day. That's absolutely amazing. Um, Gillies learned from these uh, procedures and he also learned that things need to be staged, which is something clearly we do as well today. Um, there was an airman who had his face really badly uh, burnt and we're, we're aware of systemic inflammatory response, um, things like that. They didn't have names for them then, but they clearly understood that it would be just too much to do too much in one go. And so when we do um, patients with syndromes, you would need to perhaps move something and, and stage the procedure. So um, cleft palates, Cruzon syndrome, things like that. Today, we still stage the procedures. Um, the other thing to remember is that these guys, whilst they were going back home, they couldn't go back home immediately. So they would be in hospital for up to three years having these procedures done. And once, once they went back home, um, they, were, they still weren't the same person uh, that they were before they left. Um, nurses were taught not to act astonished or act um, uh, surprised when they saw uh, these wounded soldiers. And mirrors were taken out of hospitals. And you wonder whether it's a good idea to do that or not, because clearly uh, the guy in the bed next to you, you look at him and he looks terrible, and he looks at you and you look terrible. And it would probably just be a good thing to look in the mirror and come to terms with things rather than, I, I'm not a psychologist, so I, I I'm just, this is my own perception on it. Um, but uh, they would even have blue benches in the parks nearby, near the hospital. And those benches were kind of designated for um, soldiers who'd been badly disfigured. And locals would be aware that, yes, it could be uh, frightening to see someone in, sitting on one of those benches. Um, the psychological impact just wasn't taken care of. Our faces are, the, are our window to the world. So, um, I look at my little boys in the morning and I give them a smile and they smile back to me and no word is, we haven't even said anything. And it's just that expression and being able to express uh, things, not to mention obviously we breathe, we, we taste, we smell, we communicate, um, speech. Where would we be without, uh, without speaking? Uh, as well as obviously eating. For soldiers too badly injured where they couldn't um, uh, get them back uh, to a satisfactory um, aesthetic outcome, they would go to what they called the Tin Noses Shop, which was a, um, a department, uh, the real name was a Masks for Facial Disfigurement Department, and they would have masks made. It took about a month to make a mask, and uh, ladies, uh, in fact, um, the explorer Scott is, uh, everybody knows about Scott, but nobody knows about his wife, who was an excellent, um, excellent uh, sculptor and she was involved in making masks for, um, for these chaps. The masks that we see are just a photograph, and if you look at a photograph, it's a static thing, there's no animation there. We look at Walt Disney these days, and you look at that compared to uh, just a static picture. The masks were clearly not as good as what we thought they were. Uh, the, the photos that we have are only black and white, so we don't know really what they look like. The masks um, didn't have function, they didn't have anything like that. These guys would go back, and um, they might not be married yet. They would think, will they get a job? Will they be able to sustain a, f a family? Will they be able to? And so there are stories about guys going back and or, or just writing a letter back home to their loved one and saying, oh, I found a new girlfriend. And you wonder whether they had found a new girlfriend or whether they were just too scared to go back home. Guys who did go home would end up uh, leaving, some of them even taking their own lives, some of them just going and uh, living in in isolation. They also didn't get a, uh, a pension. So if you lost a limb, you'd get a pension. And if you had facial disfigurement, you, you wouldn't get that. You wouldn't get that. Um, so even after the success of, success of surgery, they might be too shy to go and live an ordinary life. Um, treating these guys today is, is, is still difficult. And we've got clearly antibiotics. We've got a lot, of, lot more stuff. Um, we still don't have excellent uh, outcomes. Um, Prof Doherty was just saying at lunchtime today, he spoke uh, with people regarding facial transplants, and it is a reality, but uh, the guy who had the first one done in 2012 apparently didn't look in the mirror either. Um, his personal choice. So World War I recognized early and aggressive management, so blood transfusion, triage, rapid transport back, um, Thomas Splint obviously saving lives, and war can, war, what, what war does is it accelerates the training. So we heard that 
doctors get trained a lot quicker. Uh, it accelerates that. And there are terms that we use these days. We talk about peer review, and we talk about evidence-based uh, medicine. And I think in these instances, they didn't call it that, but that's exactly what they were doing. And we should be documenting and doing these things in our everyday, everyday things that we do. Uh, there's a BBC article, well not an article, a presentation, and they say, what would you do? I'd like you guys to just uh, reflect on this for yourself. If you had that terrible facial disfigurement, would you uh, opt for surgery? Uh, outcome, not really sure. Um, would you wear a mask? Would you wear the scars with pride? Or would you just avoid going back to the public? Thanks. Just from, from memory, there's a, a, the American poet E.E. E. Cummings wrote a war poem called, called Etc. And as I remember it, it goes something like this. My sweet old etc. Aunt Lucy during the recent war could and what's more did tell you what everyone was what, fighting for. As for me, I just lay in the mud and thought of your hands, your eyes, your knees, and of your etc. I, I like that poem. <laughs> Probably got it wrong. I, mi I misquoted the Bible and Shakespeare too. <laughs> so I wrote this down. I don't usually write talks down. If I should die, think only this of me, that there's some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam. A body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by the sons of home. It's commissioned in the Royal Navy Volunteer Reserve as a sub-lieutenant. 28-year-old Rupert Brooke sailed on the disastrous Dardanelles campaign and died on a French hospital ship in 1915 from a mosquito bite that turned septic. He lies in an olive grove on the Greek island of Shkirosh, which, as I understand it, is very close to Gallipoli. According to Yates, Brooks, Brooke was the handsomest young man in England. I love the way the English say things like that. I don't think Yates' statistical analysis would have been any better than a news poll, but still, <laughs> um, the handsomest young man in England, the cleverest young man of his year. I love those statements. They're, they're so over the top. What a waste. Stupidity of war, and especially of this 1914-18 war, which I've always regarded as the stupidest of all wars, and I've always sought to understand, because to some extent I overlap a bit with it. No, I'm not that old, but, um, but there is some overlap. Up to World War I, Brooks' fate to die of infection rather than wounds was the norm for soldiers. Apart from being the Gallipoli centenary, 2015, also marks 150 years since the end of the American Civil War, which in a sense was the first of the modern wars. They didn't have machine guns, but they had repeating rifles. And they had quite a bit of the ordnance that we saw later, and bombs and explosives and all the rest of it. In that conflict, which came right at the time of Pasteur, right, it came right at the time that Pasteur was really establishing the germ theory of infectious disease. And pioneers like Semmelweis and Lister were just beginning to establish the link principles of medical hygiene and antiseptic surgery. Then, more than four times as many soldiers died of disease as died of wounds. But with the enormous advances in understanding, sanitation and technology that occurred through the latter part of the 19th century, and there were great advances. Our soldiers were vaccinated against typhoid en route to Egypt. They didn't like it very much, but they got the vaccine. So that had changed dramatically by World War I. Overall, throughout the hostilities, the ratio of deaths from infectious versus combat in 1914 went from four and is to one in 1861-65 to 1.1 1 .1 is to one in 1914 -18. By World War II, that ratio had changed to one is to seven or so, at least for American troops. 
And that, of course, reflects that enormous advance in medicine, in vaccine development, tetanus vaccine, and all the rest of it that occurred through those years. Uh, Sharon mentioned Sir William Osler. It, it's that early part of the 20th century that sees the beginnings of evidence-based medicine, particularly in institutions like Johns Hopkins University in the United States. Reflecting the intensity of the fighting and perhaps the very dry conditions, though Sharon mentioned many suffer from diarrhoea, our boys at Gallipoli suffered something like 5,400 killed in action compared with 665 who in the official war record is designated as dying of infection. So that was dramatically different. Later in France, the members of the first AIF were to suffer along with everyone else the constancy of lice infestations and the horror of trench foot, which could lead to amputation and was best treated by having a supply of dry socks, which is pretty difficult in wet trenches, and smearing the feet with whale grease. That was kind of bad for the whales. And it was also bad, uh, all, the, the whale grease was also used, incidentally, to protect the faces of the fighter pilots in World War I from the blowback from the machine guns. They'd come out of their planes and they'd be totally black. Didn't protect them from something else. A lot of World War I fighter pilots later developed cancer in the nose and pharynx. And the reason for that is that the fuel for those early engines, those rotary engines, contained castor oil. And that was blowing back into their face as well. Castor oil is a great carcinogen. Then there was five-day trench fever, which was caused by Rickettsia quintana. That wasn't worked out till after the war. While well, thousands of the wounded died of tetanus and gangrene. And so the list goes on. And it wasn't just the soldiers who were afflicted. Sharon told us something of the uh, women doctors who went. Uh, there were large numbers of nurses and VADs and other women who cared for the sick and wounded. And they suffered too. They suffered from severe infections, especially to their hands, from the suppurating wounds that they tended. The women too caught the diseases of the trenches, typhus, dysentery, measles, mumps and influenza. And influenza, of course, provides the key events for Tom Keneally's fine World War I novel, The Daughters of Mars, which deals with, with two sisters and their fate. And it was the 1918 influenza pandemic which killed more than 40 million people worldwide that helped bring this disastrous conflict to an end by weakening the armies of both sides. Neither admitted to the problem, of course, which is why it was called the Spanish flu. I mean, the Spanish weren't in the war. They put their hand up and said, we've got the flu. So it's called the Spanish flu. <laughs> Any good, good lawyer will tell you never admit to anything. And uh, that's one reason. The debate concerning the origins of that influenza virus. Some believed that a milder form, a less virulent form, was circulating, possibly first in British troops, as early as 1916. You might wonder why we don't know. Well, we didn't isolate the influenza virus during the First World War. The first influenza virus wasn't actually isolated until 1931 from pigs in the United States, and then a little bit later, uh, from, from humans in, in, uh, in London, at the National Institute of Medical Research in Mill Hill. Others think that it didn't start in 1916, but it actually began in Kansas in February of 1918 and was brought across to Europe by the US troop ships. They were having deaths early on in Kansas and the US training tramps camps actually served as an incubator, and then the relatively short boat ride across to Europe also ramped it up. So the Americans really suffered very, very badly from the influenza. And one of the reasons for thinking that there may have been an earlier virus circulating is that the Americans were much worse affected than, for instance, our soldiers who'd been there for quite a long time. So there may have been pre-immunity that protected many uh, from, the, from the most severe of the infections. Overall, the figures show that looking at US soldiers, uh, including those who never got anywhere near the front, almost twice as many people died of infections as of wounds in World War I. And I think that's probably influenza. What about our, our, our soldiers? Between July 1918 and February 1919, 
Humphrey McQueen, the historian, reads that 10% of the Australian soldiers in Britain were infected and 209 died. Perhaps protected by the long voyage out, the disease didn't actually get to Australia until 1919, mid-1919, though it was in New Zealand much earlier, and they had a bad time of it and, uh, and had a lot of deaths. And there were other sequelae, of course. For the returned Australian soldiers, more than 3,000 suffered from tuberculosis, and so many with lungs irrevocably damaged by gas attacks died early from various respiratory infections. I knew some of these people. I was born in 1940, and I was taught by some of these damaged men. And I also was taught by single women who'd lost so much in this great and entirely avoidable catastrophe. When I think about 1914-18, I still have enormous questions in my mind, and I can't regard it with anything other than a sense of profound personal grief. Thank you very much, all of our speakers, for really leaving us with so much to think about. I'm not even quite sure where to start with the question, but I do want to um, really just return to, to the start of our discussion about loss of potential as opposed to opportunities. Because I think, you know, one of the things that the First World War did do uh, for Australian society was it opened up opportunities, particularly for returned servicemen who'd had little education. They could, through repatriation schemes, uh, gain further training. Um, and in fact, it, it did serve to, uh, I suppose, unsettle some of the, the set class barriers um, in Australia. But, you know, those two things, a loss, a great loss of potential, but then I'm thinking, um, Sharon, when you talk about women, uh, women doctors in many ways had some opportunities overseas. They were disadvantaged when they returned because of the preferential employment of employed, uh, of, of returned servicemen, but also other jobs opened up in a for instance, in public health, and I'm thinking of someone like Vera Scantably Brown, who had to move into that area. And I think that, uh, you know, lo loss and an opportunity uh, really runs through all of these in a way, because there are new opportunities, um, of course, to, tr to trial and perfect surgical procedures that would never occur in... Um, in peacetime. So I just wondered if you had any further thoughts. This is really a question to everyone on the panel about um, how war disrupted that, and particularly the First World War, which I, I certainly agree with Peter. When you look back now, you know, what were they fighting for uh, becomes really a very pertinent question. It's just it's extraordinary war of attrition. So, anyone want to respond? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Any any other thoughts? Well, um, yes. I think I, I guess if we go back to this issue around um, opportunity and experience, and especially very very young people, or in the cases that I was speaking about with uh, women, are given these incredible responsibilities at such a very young age. Um, I guess you could see, you know, as as, a, as an opportunity, but. Um, in, in extraordinarily difficult circumstances, and I was, um, I was when I was reading about um, the opportunities when they came back. Suddenly, everything narrowed completely, and women. Uh, you mentioned about going to public health. That was really one of the only options, and it was um, there was the, it was just the, so little choice, and yet they had obviously proved themselves so competent in um, being able to face up to those challenges. I was quite stunned by that. It was um, I. It was wonderful that women were already being trained at that time, but still the opportunities were really so much more limited. I think one of the things that I found slightly depressing was the story you told of the women coming back finding the barriers to promotion through their medical profession, mm -hmm. at least from a medical research perspective, are still around 100 years later. There's almost in every institution, yeah. we now have more than 50% of our 
undergraduates and, and graduate students in biology and medicine are women. And yet when we get to the professorial level, despite the fact that we've had that equality of entry into the profession probably for 40 years, it's still at somewhere between 10 and 15 per cent. So, yeah. you know, not a lot's changed. I was uh, intrigued by your, your statement about the STDs. Uh, yeah. Because, uh, you know, I'm reading up on this, and I'm glad I didn't go into STDs because you did. But um, the, uh, as Figur I recall... Figuratively, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. yes that, that, that too. You'd though. handle that. But... Um, but uh, as I recall, the British at least had organised brothels. Uh, for, separate, of course, for the enlisted men and the officers, as one must. But uh, That's did right. they have such a severe sanction against those who contracted? Did, did the British? I, I don't know. I just read this around the, Austra the, the Australian. So, so we condemned people for having sex. They shot people, and we didn't shoot people, but they, they, yeah, we didn't yeah. shoot our own people. Yeah, no, and, and it, well, in fact, that. Um, Opportunities for you know um, accessing brothels were widespread around in Egypt, particularly. That was a really significant yes, part of it. France and and then the UK. But the response and how it was managed was was really um, in yeah. terrible. The other thing I wanted to ask Peter, as an older gentleman, was what do vulcanised condoms look like? <laughs> You're, you're, yeah, you're right, also from too. Queensland, so as a young man in the 1940s, or maybe 1950s... The only thing I can remember about vulcanisation was a sort of a patch that you used to put on tyres and you'd screw it up with a thing, and then there was a kind of surrounding thing that you would light and it would heat. So I, I don't quite, quite envisage a vulcanised combat, but I suspect they must have been used by Scottish regiments. <laughs> I don't think people use them full stop, basically, but they, they were around. But they, I mean, they were using, in, historically, people use things like in, um, sheep intestine, and, which seems less uh, atrocious than a vulcanised. Uh, <laughs> vulcanised haggis. <laughs> a vulcanised haggis would be terrible. <laughs> Yeah, look, look, I suppose, uh, just following up there on, on that point, you know, in some ways, 1915 seems a very long time ago and I think it's very hard to imagine the scale, the actual scale of the fighting and the war from our perspective now. But there are, um, of course, many things uh, in our society um, that, that remain in some ways the same, mentioning about barriers to women in, in medicine. Obviously, though, I just want to think about medical training um, uh, and how, I mean, that has changed dramatically. Um, all of you who've had to deal with students, both undergraduate and postgraduate in, in medicine, I mean, you know, sometimes think, uh, how, how, would, how would your students cope or in this um, situation? And that thing about very young people, just wondering about any thoughts there, because certainly we hope I know, but we, we hope that medical training has changed. But would, would uh, our graduates be prepared for well, scale? I was for a time a, um, um, well, I was, I was actually in a, an associate institute, but I was a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And I think we got about five people shot a day in Philadelphia. And so they got plenty of trauma experience, actually, if they cared to do so. And, uh, and also, I, I want to ask Warren that, that now, with, I mean, those horrific damage that we see, and, and some have written, I think Pat Barker wrote about it in novels, didn't she? And the horrific damage that happened to people. And, but now, with, with modern medicine and helicopter evacuation and so forth, I understand that some of the injuries that people survive are infinitely worse than they ever survived before. And how do they cope with that? Do you see any of that? Is it? Um. Clearly in Melbourne, fortunately, we're not really seeing a lot of that. But back in South Africa, yes, yes. Um, um, a lot of, um, even in private practice, uh, hijacking um, facial injuries because a guy steps up to the car window, shoots through the window, and um, neck injuries that s no one would have survived, uh, people are surviving. And so um, because you get such quick response, uh, an ethicist get... Um, great intubation techniques, to, you know, things have really come a long way, but the, it does mean that much more significant injuries are survived and then you've got yeah. to try and deal with the aftermath. Yeah, it's yeah. certainly been the case yeah. in many of the yeah. American yeah. veterans, hasn't it? So 
I was going to get back to your question, Kate. Um, much of med, there's a whole lot of, we, at the moment, we, uh, most medical courses or undergraduate courses range between five and six years, postgraduate courses about four years. And the traditional model was to do three years at university and three years in the hospital. But actually, most of your, um, there's a lot of fundamental scientific principles that underpin medicine, but really a lot of it is apprenticeship and learning on the job. And it still remains the case now, and I think particularly with surgery. So I think in, in the settings that, that these men were exposed to, or women, was just the volume of work and the incredible experience. I, I guess, I gather, there was minimal supervision. That's the difference. But, and that, that means that you don't get trained in the same way that you would with under supervision. But a lot of your expertise in medicine is, is around, um, you know, um, kilometres driven or, you know, how much, how much time you've actually spent doing, doing, not just studying. So I would have thought people would bec have become very competent very quickly. But then there's all the other stuff that we really, it is so important around the support and de psychological support required and strength in dealing in those situations, which I gather they would have had none of that. So. Um, I, I think um, just looking at the numbers, they would be uh, learning by discovery, and that was pertinent for the time because mm. if people don't know stuff, uh, simple stuff you can learn by discovery. We are not anymore, uh, we shouldn't be allowing uh, postgraduates to learn by discovery. They should be, you know, learn from somebody who knows. <laughs> we know that. Um, Having said that, just what I was saying about sporadic things, if something just happens every now and then, it's quite difficult to build on your experience. Whereas if you've done a lot of something, it's, it's second nature to you. Yeah. 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 Well, look, just to finish off this evening, I'm going to take a couple of questions uh, from, the, from the floor um, because I think there's so much to ask. Can I... Um, we have one. Did you have your hand up? Yes. Yes. We've got. Uh, we'll just wait for the microphone if we can. Yeah, we'll come. Oh, we'll start here and then we'll come over. Um, that was a, a very interesting presentation. Uh, what interests me is uh, what uh, legacy um, did uh, the medical practice during World War One um, leave on uh, um, on medical practice in the civilian sphere and also on medical research because uh, usually large conflicts like this do have an enormous impact, particularly on medical research. Any comments on that? Uh, I'm happy to talk just briefly on, on the medical research. Um, you know, certainly both Kellaway and Patterson's experience in London before the war and then during the war where they, conduct, they both conducted research during the war I think led to, you know, one of the enduring themes at the Walton Eliza Hall Institute and probably influenced their recruitment and that was simply an infectious disease. So for much of the first 30 or 40 years of, of the Institute's existence, other than working on snake bites, infectious disease was the big thing. And that, you know, I think in many ways you can then see that transforming into the golden years of immunology as Burnett shifted the focus of the Institute from trying to understand infectious diseases one at a time to trying to understand how the body would respond generically to infectious disease. And, you know, so from an a institutional viewpoint and a, a science in Melbourne viewpoint, you know, I think you can trace a lot of the themes of medical research locally down to the experiences of those two men in the First World War. No, I think also infectious disease really, the research really got underway in the yeah. 19th century. Yeah. And uh, the latter half of the 19th century is absolutely an extraordinary period. And you have these institutes that are focused on infectious disease, but almost nothing else in medicine that's a really high quality research institute. And then it's really with people like Osler and so forth that you start to see true academic medicine emerging in the earlier part of the, uh, of the 20th century. So, and, and then, you know, by 1967, I think, Doug's predecessor, McFarlane Burnett, was saying the era of infectious disease was over. Well, that was before Sharon started working on That's HIV. True. We didn't know about <laughs> HIV. So, so, you know, it's always with us, but... but Mac um, Burnett was wrong about quite a few things in his later years. He was right about quite a he few things. He was right about too. quite a few things Pretty extraordinary well. guy, actually, yeah. but... Uh, yeah. I've got a, another question here. 
I'm, I'm old enough to know, you know, people from the First World War and the impact that had on them. And I was, and I was, um, I'm just a bit worried that we're we're losing touch with that experience, and we might be losing, um, um, we might be losing uh, the lessons we learned in the Second World War. People were afraid to be into the Second World War because they remembered what happened in the First World War. People learned those lessons. Are we losing those lessons we learned in medicine and other areas? We're not being afraid of what's happening in Syria and so on because we've. Um, because we started losing. No, I, I, I grew up with both those generations, really. I mean, uh, my father's generation was the Second World War generation, and then the generation before that was still around. I, I, they would come to our school and talk on Anzac Day. We would talk with them. I don't remember any of them, firstly, ever really wanting to talk about war, and I certainly don't remember anyone ever glorifying war in any sense whatsoever. So I'm quite disturbed by some of this... Um, um, militaristic fervour we seem to be developing. Anyone else want to comment on, got any questions? No? I mean, just to add to that, I'm, I'm actually a historian of the Second World War um, and, very, and the home front in particular um, is one of the areas I've written extensively on. And I think that uh, the shadow of the First World War is so strong with the second, um, but you know we have to remember it's a generation later. It's 20 years later. It's literally fathers and sons and families um, as well. So you know your question is really about uh, how we remember as time goes past, and and certainly uh, now there are there are small numbers of veterans um, remaining from the Second World War. You know. T time is moving so quickly um, that I think it's important we do remember and we remember the scale and, and the horror um, of, of all wars, really. Any, any other questions from... Yes, we've got one up here to finish off. Well, that uh, brings what you just said, the home front. You know, if all the medical schools in Australia were shooting these kids out so they could go over to Europe, what was the medicine like in Australia? Was everybody dropping dead because there were no doctors around? Or? <laughs> I didn't want to comment. I no idea. I don't know. Well, I mean, I can comment just briefly. Um, of, of course, you know, the First World War and the Second World War and current wars, you know, youth is a great, uh, it's the young people who, who are wanted uh, to go over there because, you know, they've got the, uh, stamina, you know, you must have had to have extraordinary stamina, I think, to uh, work in the medical uh, areas in the First World War. So there is, there are elderly doctors and nurses, you know, not everyone, uh, not everyone goes. Um, so there still is uh, healthcare in Australia, although actually it must have been, I don't know entirely, but it must have been somewhat diminished because a lot of women went, a lot of the nurses went as well. But, I mean, that's a very good question. Of course, war does come home in a medical sense with um, the flu pandemic, you know. Uh, at the end of the war, um, that spreads into the civilian population. Um, and uh, that's where the states all try and, and put up quarantine and between each other and... Uh, all sorts of things to try and stop the spread. Well, look, I think we, we probably have to, to come to a close uh, for this uh, panel. I'd like to thank uh, everyone tonight um, for their comments and for the discussion, and also to thank those who've brought this series together, um, including Lucy Chancellor Wheel um, and the engagement team. Um, and those in the audience who are interested in medical questions that arise out of the First World War uh, might also like to note that there's um, a, a later panel discussion on the 17th of June at the Melbourne Museum that's looking at advances in the understanding of psychology created by the war. And, of course, that's the other part 
of, if you like, medical research is, is how um, uh, work on psychology it, it really moves after the, the First World War. Um, and you can certainly book that online. So wish you um, all well this evening, for the rest of the evening, and hope to see you at future university events. Thank you very much to the audience, and thanks to our panel. <laughs>